going to start right now. It's important to begin. Let me introduce to you. We have in this panel Ana Giros, who is the CIO of Europe for Europe and Latin America for Swiss. Uh, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz, he is the CIO of the International Center for Trained uh, and Sustainable Development. Mr. Carlos Represas, he is the chairman for Latin America of Swiss Re, amongst many other important positions that he has occupied. And he will join us soon. Mr. Luis Gilberto Murillo he is the Minister of the Environment of Colombia. I am Leo Schlesinger. Today I, I am the leader of Aliat Universities, a group of higher education in Mexico. And until not long ago, I was leading MASISA, the Latin American Company of Natural Resources. And I was uh, chairman of the Global Agenda Council of Natural Capital and Yango Valider. We have heard a lot about climate change as the problem or the greatest challenge of our era. And probably it's truth. It is clear that today, in terms of the environment, we have huge challenges. And probably we are going on the very dangerous track, I would say. Climate change is just one of the subjects, of the topics, but as we see, there is a great, huge degradation of our ecosystems. We have lost in the planet a great amount of biodiversity and tropical forest mass. We are plastifying the oceans. And not to talk about water and water abuse, well, abuses regarding that resource. So this is a consequence of not understanding the limits, limitations of our planet in terms of how much it can produce and how much can we really use in our productive processes of what the planet is able to regenerate if we think in our planet and the environment as a checking account in a bank. In order to be sustainable, we should think, well, live out of the interest produced by this account. Today's studies such as the Global Footprint Network and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development tell us that today, if the planet produces 100, if our oceans are able to reproduce a X amount of fishes and the trees in the forest, uh, may reproduce themselves in an X amount. And uh, well, today out of this 100, we are using 130. So we are far beyond the limits. We are using 30% more of what the planet is able to regenerate in one year. If we go to 2025, the calculations are that we are going to be occupying 80% more. And if we go to 1050, it is thought or calculated that we are going to be occupying more than 2.3 times more than what the planet is able to regenerate. And the model in which we are basing ourselves is the model of the United States, that if we would consume and produce in the same way of they produce and consume in USA, we would need five planets. So the model does not sustain, it is clear, the limits that the planet has. Climate change today is a reality. Many can tell us, no, it's not so. And there are also in the media a lot being said about the reality of climate change. But today, it is not to be discussed. Climate change is real. We are experiencing, this is the hottest year in historical records. We cannot deny either that climate change is being produced by the direct influence of the human beings' actions that we are issuing, that we are sending out to the air greenhouse effect gases and CO2 as well, and that we are experiencing the effects of climate change today. The COP21 has been called. It's an agreement without ever had been that or taking place in the history. It is pending for those who 
have signed it. 185 countries out of 195 signed it. And one of the main elements that this is aiming at is to limit the temperature increases of only two degrees with a base of pre-industry levels of 1,750 and on. And it forces us, those who have signed the agreement, to reduce the greenhouse effects gases and also it includes mitigation actions and it assumes that many of the climate change effects are, are unavoidable. But we were talking a minute ago with Carlos. Welcome, Mr. Minister. Thank you. That climate change is already here and we have to be very much aware of that and how to mitigate it. And it also, the COP contemplates or, uh, about the re existing relationship between the actions of adaptation and mitigation with the impact amongst the poorest, because understanding that they are the ones who will be suffering most, and for that reason, it also determines a fund. And we hope that this does happen by 2020 of $100 billion for these type of actions. And uh, today's panel, well, really, we are going to work and talk about two main topics, two questions that will give us a lot of subjects to talk about. The first one is what things are we doing from the different organizations here? We have an interesting representation of the from the private sector, the public sector, Think Times Academy. And uh, what is it what is being done from each sector to comply with these agreements and to um, mitigate climate changes? And the second question has to do with, well, we are in the COP21. There are 20 befores and agreements and Kyoto and all sorts of agreements that have not given the expected results. Why is this time different or not? And to understanding a little bit what are the barriers that make this to be so. I'd like to start with my right side with uh, Anna. And please, to the first question, will you give us an answer? Good afternoon. The first question, I would start with context elements. COP21, and I I'm representing Suez, which is one of the big companies that have to do with the environment. And by most, we saw it maybe on an exceptional basis, not because it is in Paris and we are in Paris, but because it was the first time where we really felt that it was not a meeting amongst governments and something just pertaining to the authorities or the countries. There we felt that commitments were delivered from the industry companies and there was an, an also participation of the civilian society and a lot of modifications and discussions, civilian society around all these subjects. And with this, there was an awareness. Uh, it is a problem of all of us and we have to build solutions and that somehow the subject of environmental impact and the act main actions in the planet are thus producing a non-sustainable impact. No one can question that. So that is the context of COP21. So we're going to have this momentum. Will it last? Will it not last? It will be a matter of the second subject. What Suez is doing, and we are quite representatives of the industry, is two things. One, we are working with our carbon-free footprint and working on solutions at the level of reuse of water energy subjects recycling <clears throat> from all our products. So we are indeed working in reducing our emissions. And we are also innovating in economy to propose our customers and our customers in the public environment as well as in the industry environment providing solutions to improve uh, the footprint at the recycling level as well as uh, concrete themes of reuse of water, because water was at the COP21 for the first time. The hydric stress was put into a roadmap of the climate. So maybe, and only a couple of examples talking about solutions, because there are solutions. So we have an agreement with UNESCO 
for the treatment of ocean pollution, plastics in the oceans. Uh, we are working on recycling, plastic recycling solutions on Earth because the problem of the ocean comes from the Earth, not from the ocean. And we are trying to do things of monitoring and remediation in the water, more concrete subjects. In Latin America, is a good example. We are working on reuse. In Mexico, we have many examples of water reuse processes in the industry, water reuse in the cities for irrigation, or to reincorporate it in the neighbors. And with that water reuse, we work in Brazil in non-revenue water. Those are the losses in the canalizations in the city and subjects that could not cannot lose 50% of water, clean water in a city. It is something that now everyone is aware of and we have a rather nice dialogue because we are not just selling products and the people don't understand why we are pushing these products forward, but there is a demand that grows increasingly. Mr. Minister, thank you. I would like to mention, first of all, that, and even more for information, in the case of Colombia, and it might be the case also of many of the countries in the region, the awareness about the need to take precise actions to that allow us to have mitigation and adaptation to the climate changes have grown a lot. And in the case of Colombia, it has grown because we come from events that do have to do with climate variability that have been quite painful for the country. And uh, for example, El Nino and La Nina phenomena, the people have felt m closer the effects that these challenges may have in the global context. And uh, the government and the Colombian society as such have been taking important measures of public policies They've issued several documents where they really defined the route uh, map that the country is going to follow in terms of adaptation and likewise mitigation uh, in climate changes. So the country has a very interesting tool, which is the Fund of Adaptation to Climate Changes that is in operation. And it was in response to this phenomena of climate variability, but beyond that, Amongst the many tools that have been created, there is one that I would like to highlight. It is a law draft that was issued in the, this year that establishes the national system for climate change. And in this, with this tool, we create a very important commission. It is the Intersectors Commission to respond to the challenges of climate change. This commission is led by the Ministry of the Environment and Sustainable Development and the National Planning Department, well, it guides us and gives us the guidelines with regards to what we should implement. One very important decision made by the country was the precisely the definition of its quota of decreasing emissions within the global context. We have a level of vision which is very small, 0 0.46, but the effects of climate change are really out of proportions in the country. And uh, that is why we define that at 20 and 30, having as a basis the year 2010, uh, but 2030, we're going to have a percentage of emissions reduction of 20%. And if we count on the international cooperation, we may even reach 30%. And at the study carried out at the University of Los Andes that supported us, we want that those measures that are going to be implemented should not go beyond or more the cost of $20 per ton. But we have huge challenges. We have to define a more real policy in terms of mitigation and adaptation to climate changes that does reflect the commitments that we have acquired within the framework of Paris Agreement. And we are going to issue this policy this year. But besides that, we are going to create a general framework, which is the general law of mitigation and adaptation to climate changes that is also going to be subject to the consideration of the Congress at the end of this year. So I would stop here, but there are many, many measures that we are implementing in the country, sectorial agreements or agreements with the private sector financial tools, because it is precisely the development framework that we would like to apply has to do 
with what we have defined of advances or progress made in the country to respond to the challenges of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Well, there is no doubt that, as you said it during the introduction, the subject of climate change will define, indeed, the viability of our economies. My own perspective is really to introduce Latin America in the global markets and how this introduction and the dependency of Latin America from the global markets has or somehow it will be defined according to the policies and actions taken by the countries with regards to climate change. So I would say to concentrate in three points that I think are important. One is the subject of energy supply, energy supply and the energy matrix of our countries. The energy we know already has between 70 and 80 percent uh, is responsible for the greenhouse effect uh, gases emission and the Paris decisions, Paris decisions, uh, so as they are now, when take us up to 2% to stabilize two degrees of stabilization of the climate. But maybe, so as we are, we will be between 2.7 and 3 degrees. So it is not sustainable, as you were saying a while ago. We also know that it is going to be necessary for at least 60% of energy production should be clean energy for 20 or 30, or if we want to reach the goals of 20 to 50 that have been established in Paris. This is a huge effort. Maybe the most important point here that I would like to highlight is that we, what we are talking about in Paris is a transformation absolutely basic of utmost importance of the production models as well as consumption models in the global economy. It is also very important to understand that the actions that we may take today have consequences at mid and long term, medium and long term, especially when it has to do with climate. Looking at the energy matrix, the highest risk in the region as well as in other regions is for us to be tied up in structures, energy structures, that at long term are going to generate huge problems in terms of sustainability and gases mitigation. Colombia, as Minister Murillo said, is just going through a tough month because of El Nino effects. It knew what is to depend upon hydrology, power sources, and fossil fuels in terms of energy, energy generation. Today, we have uh, responses, answers in terms of clean energy. Clean energy continues to be in Latin America, not very much, the, the supply. But it is growing at a great speed. By 2014, the region in terms of en uh, sun energy is about 40 percent and in term no sorry sun energy almost 400 percent and in eolic energy 40 percent or something like that so there is a big room president Mackey said it this morning and president santos also said it but we need strategies and policies that are focused on, on stimulating and encouraging clean energy generation. This happens, and going back to the global economy, starts with reviewing the trade and investment frameworks and how they affect the supply of intermediate and capital goods that are necessary for clean energy generation. And there we have big problems, beginning with customs, uh, rates, and uh, clean energy technologies and services, all sorts of barriers and obstacles, and energy and fiscal and macro policies, regional policies that do not encourage or discourage the investment in clean energy. So there is an important agenda for the region. The other one has to do that it is linked to the links between water and energy, land use, forest, and climate change. Indeed, this morning there was a session where Martin von Hindebrandt, who's been studying the Colombian Amazons uh, region, was mentioning the need to work in what he calls 
the corridor, which is the Andes, the Amazon region, and the Atlantic Ocean. It provides water, including irrigation, through well for agricultural purposes in many countries of the continent. And once again, there it is necessary to understand the pressures in terms of the agriculture production, mining production, exploration of resources, and fossil fuels, and human about the land and about water. And to have very clear strategies that, that we should be able to adapt. What's important is that everything is going to be pretty immediate. Uh, the Paris Agreement offers a series of instruments which are very interesting in order to support these countries with regards to that type of strategy. And one that I'm particularly interested in, I've been promoting it for some years, is to establish a price for coal through coal markets. Uh, the region in general, Colombia in particular has a great capital uh, that it can offer in this area, but it's very important to organize these coal markets. This is being done in Mexico. This is being done in Colombia. Uh, the minister is part of this climate strategy, but we need to think beyond this. Uh, for instance, so we need to link different coal markets. Uh, there is an experience between California and Quebec and uh, I'm in Switzerland uh, and now. Uh, there's some conversations going on between the Europeans and Korea and the Europeans and China. China is going to establish a domestic uh, carbon market by 2017. And this uh, could change uh, uh, from a global perspective. It could change the viability of coal markets. Uh, once again, in the region, uh, it would be very important to uh, work uh, with the trade agreements, for instance, uh, the Pacific Alliance and others. Uh, and uh, uh, we must uh, work uh, through these channels in order to establish coal price uh, because it is uh, through these uh, international channels that we'll be able to mitigate vol volatility and uh, the problems that would uh, generate it if uh, some countries uh, adapt their prices and some don't. Uh, the main part of the uh, Paris Agreement is that uh, countries uh, should uh, take on uh, these uh, obligations or contributions uh, which will be determined at a domestic uh, level in a symmetric uh, manner so that uh, uh, there will be an appropriate uh, ambience uh, for competitiveness and for uh, in order for the appropriate prices to be put in place. So, so we need to think about what would be the strategies at a global level in order to try and mitigate uh, disruptive of possibilities that can come up if we don't establish this price uh, for coal. And then we need to think about coal, which is incorporated into goods and services. Uh, this is a new topic. We are just beginning to study this topic. Perhaps uh, the Europeans have made more progress in this than other countries. But we should know which is the net import expert of uh, coal in different countries. Um, when uh, when one understands what is the uh, carbon and imported goods, uh, one understands uh, that uh, the composition is very different from the one that we're acquainted with, especially we think about the production sources uh, such as uh, coal emissions. Um, uh, so uh, once we think about this, uh, we have to start working on policies uh, that uh, will be oriented towards uh, mitigating uh, carbon in, uh, in consumption. And this is going to be very important uh, in terms of the management of this topic. Um, uh, this is a very important uh, topic globally uh, because we need uh, to work to harmonize the different policies so there won't be price uh, discrepancies in the international markets. Yes, of course, Leo. My answer, my direct answer to your question would be, uh, will things be different this time around? And why will it be different? Uh, well, partly because of what uh, Minister Murillo was saying a while ago. Uh, I think awareness ha has been gained about the problem. And uh, this this is going to create a different reaction towards uh, the commitments uh, that were taken on by COP21. 
Not all countries accepted them, but anyway, there are some commitments in the past. Uh, um, I think we have to deal with this in a different way because we are gaining more and more awareness of the fact that we are the last generation that can do something in this regard. So this awareness, uh, for me, is of great value because it mm, leads us to action. We need to act. Uh, uh, Part of this problem that we are facing has to do with population growth. Of course, this is inevitable. And uh, as uh, many other people who are here, no doubt, uh, I am part of the only generation in the history of humanity which uh, during their uh, lifetime, the uh, world population grew by three times. Uh, This had never happened before population going up uh, by three times, and in the future this will not happen again because uh, this is simply not sustainable because uh, the the world cannot sustain uh, population growth as such as uh, that we're talking about 2 to 2.5 billion and uh, population, and we will be talking about 7 or 7.5 billion. Uh, so this uh, means uh, that we have to continue to gain awareness. This is uh, pertinent to what Ms. Minister Murillo was saying. As a Mexican uh, citizen, as a Latin American citizen, I'm very proud of the role of, uh, that uh, Latin America played uh, in uh, Paris. I think the different um, countries in Latin America made a great contribution. They supported the commitment uh, that was set in Paris, and I think the role we played as uh, a region was uh, was exceptional, was very good, so we should be proud of that. No doubt uh, that the number of actions and efforts uh, that we need uh, to start are very significant. Uh, I think that Ricardo just uh, summarized very holistically for us uh, what it is that we need to do. We need to work on this pr- uh, problem so as to achieve our objectives. Uh, you were talking about uh, two uh, degrees uh, Celsius uh, or one and a half as a goal, not as an objective. And uh, I think we need to move this forward. I think the um, uh, businesses, individuals, uh, our academia, our education with uh, childhood will push us in this direction. And I think the role that I represent in this panel is the following. So what my question is, is all this enough? Um, Having done what we said we're going to do, have we achieved what we want to achieve? So hence my concern. Uh, about the fact that uh, we will not be able to prevent many of the problems that are already here, that are affecting us, are impacting us, and will continue to affect and impact us, and actually they're going to continue to grow. So the question would be, what should we do in order to confront or face up uh, what will inevitably happen in spite of our efforts. Uh, And I think the effort is not only worthwhile, it is mandatory that we display such efforts. So for me, uh, there is an enormous responsibility at a government level, uh, but also there is responsibility on society as a whole to protect uh, society and to make sure that they will be able to deal with natural disasters uh, that will come our way. So uh, we all hope and we think that they might uh, be lesser catastrophes uh, insofar as we improve uh, the work that we're doing with the environment, but they will come. You can be sure that these natural disasters will come because we're paying for what we have done poorly in the past. Uh, So it is, uh, once again, uh, very important to become uh, more aware of our environmental problems uh, and uh, to come up uh, with a way to become resilient uh, vis-a-vis these uh, natural disasters. Uh, We must be able uh, to come up uh, with uh, action so that we can deal with the immediate consequences of the disasters that uh, will probably be coming our way. And uh, Given the risks uh, that are ahead of us, uh, we will start uh, to give value to those things 
that we are not doing. In other words, if you buy in, uh, if you buy insurance for a particular thing, you're giving value to that thing. So we begin, we must begin to understand what it is that we're not doing right. Uh, so not only are we going to have to face up to the responsibility of redoing whatever gets destroyed after a natural disaster, but on top of this, we have to accept that that value, that weight, uh, that difficulty. So if you don't do this, what is the price that you're going to have to pay? If you do not take action now, what will happen in the future? So there's, got, there's going to be a sort of a, a premium that you will have to pay because socially you will be granting value to those things which you are not doing. And in addition to this, uh, from the point of view of rating agencies, which are very important for the different countries, is that the fact that uh, you are protected um, uh, from disasters uh, will actually improve your credit rating. And it will improve it not only domestically, but also at an international level. So it's very important to have uh, an active participation of the insurance world uh, on uh, uh, the part of my company, Swiss Re, we have been increasing our risk coverage by $10 billion, precisely because we're aware of the risk. We know that the risk is there and because we're aware of the fact that we have to make an effort and become a more aware of uh, the impact of a disaster, because as long as we don't know what that impact is, we are not doing the necessary things to prevent those disasters. So why, why will things work this time? Because we've done many things, but not everything has been done. So in a COP21, there were other agreements, the Kyoto Agreement, Paris Agreement, but many agreements have taken place and nothing has really happened to the environment. I am, I am very optimistic. Um, and there are two topics that we're dealing with here and there is no going back. Uh, first of all, we have all understood that we need to go from linear production to a circular economy, and uh, both uh, with regards uh, to uh, recycling and power production and, and recycling of raw material. Well, we know that plastics have to be recycled. We can no longer continue to throw them into the ocean. There's no going back on this. A circular economy is a fact. It is here to stay. And another topic on which we cannot go back is the increase of that social awareness that we need to have that awareness uh, of the industry that things cannot go on the way they've been going on. And uh, we need to feed into all these topics. In other words, we need to create a moment and a space, and then we need to thrust it forward. And if um, there are certain contributions that need to be made as well, are those contributions uh, within a legal framework? The legislative framework of the different countries has to evolve. Uh, a practical uh, example, uh, for instance, in France, we have reinjection of biogas in um, water treatment plants uh, and in the biomass. Uh, plants, uh, biogas is being created, uh, but up until 2014, this biogas could not be reinjected into the network, so you didn't really know what to do with biogas. It was nice as a concept, but then the legislation changed, uh, and now we're reinjecting biogas in many of uh, the French cities, and this is a very circular way uh, to use the resources that come out uh, from a water treatment plant. It's a way to use organic or agricultural biomass that uh, come out of uh, the uh, dumping grounds. Uh, so we need to work on this. This has to evolve. We're pushing this forward at different levels. And then uh, we need to also work uh, with the different businesses. Um, we need to innovate at an industrial level because to just think about nine billion people in a planet is, is simply catastrophic. Uh, so we need to innovate. We need, we need to innovate and we need to be ready because if this happens, it's going to be a huge problem. We're going to open the discussion now for the panel members and uh, to the uh, audience um, because clearly we see that there are series of interests uh, related to the environment. Um, uh, in the economic arena, there is a conflict of interest. Uh, there are subsidies. Uh, there are lobbyists and there are all sorts of elements that have made uh, this topic uh, a hard one to deal with. Uh, there is a media war against uh, or for climate change. Uh, so 
what can we do? How do we tackle this? Uh, even if we have 185 signatures out of 195 participants in a COP, but who will guarantee that these forces that are working together, uh, what will they do? Because uh, things that they've done have really not worked up to now, but now they're beginning to work. I think that you are actually hitting the bullseye. Um, you have said, why is this possible now and before it was not? We do not know if it's possible, uh, but we know that what was done in Paris was to sign a, a universal agreement with one binding agreement, uh, and that is to stabilize uh, the climate at two degrees. Uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, the rest is uh, just about uh, voluntary contributions. And in a sovereign manner, each country will offer an option, but with a transparent mechanism, a follow-up mechanism, or a technical mechanism, uh, or an accreditation mechanism. All these mechanisms will finally guarantee that these contributions will take us to that uh, objective of two degrees. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there is vulnerability in this agreement because it is not a legal framework uh, as the previous ones. One, uh, this is one of the reasons why it did not work in the past. It is much harder to make countries agree uh, through um, binding agreements uh, on a particular action. Uh, now, the other part uh, which has generated a great deal of enthusiasm uh, is uh, the proclamation, uh, which in uh, English is called a uh, bottom-up, uh, in terms of contributions, uh, where different um, businesses participate, the cities, national governments participate, and all other players uh, that in one way or another are committed to, uh, uh, to work for um, or against climate change. Uh, uh, this is an experiment at an international level. This is what the Paris Agreement was. This is an experiment on a topic which is absolutely vital. We must not fool ourselves. In 2020, we will really know if uh, we have reached an agreement that uh, will take us where we need to go. And uh, uh, this uh, takes us to another point. Uh, for 2020, the increase in emissions are going to be huge, and we will be generating a great deal of, it, of tension between the governments, the civil population, who will be impacted because of the biophysical consequences of the um, climatic change, such that it will be a different world. So we will know if this agreement will be able to be maintained or if it will be necessary to go into a different kind of agreement that might be safer, particularly at a legal level perhaps a secure, an environmental security law. This is what we might need. Uh, and I think it's very important to place things within, uh, within that context because the enthusiasm about Paris is very important uh, so that we will go to 2020 where we shall be tested against something that should be totally viable. Uh, but uh, we are facing an agreement which is weak, uh, vulnerable, and it's certainly not carved in stone in terms of uh, what the international cooperation can achieve in terms of climate change. I don't know what the minister will say because he was there. So I want to say something in this regard. I think uh, that there are still voices uh, that are detractors of uh, this effort. Uh, these are voices uh, that are from the past. Uh, in other words, uh, these changes uh, will have always taken place. Uh, this is the history of humanity because you know, in the Ice Age, uh, this and that happened, but at the end, nothing happened. In other words, uh, these detractors are looking to minimize the effects of climate change. I think we need to make a greater information effort. And definitely, I think uh, uh, this is a role for International Economic Forum. We, uh, the forum has been uh, carrying out this job, uh, information, uh, sensitization, awareness. Uh, uh, and we have to continue to do this job to, to sensitize, to be people, uh, to make uh, sure people are more aware and uh, to make sure we do not uh, uh, decrease the importance of the effort that we must carry out. And also, we need to be very aware of the costs uh, for society. 
these natural disasters uh, that come one after the other. What is the cost for society of these natural disasters? Uh, we have a publication in Swiss Re, and we publish this every year. We publish information about natural disasters, the cost for society about these natural disasters, and how they're increasing every year. And I think uh, we have to continue to increase this awareness. Uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Tropis is saying is very true. And uh, uh, here in Colombia, we have made a great educational effort on the measures that we need to take and the cost that these measures uh, imply. Now, uh, if we talk about the increase of awareness about the natural phenomena themselves, I think there is a space for political priority, which will be very important, such that governments will do everything in their power so that this mechanism will indeed be able to work. And uh, we also need to establish what else is needed to make the necessary adjust adjustments as they're needed. Uh, in addition uh, to raising awareness, uh, because now the community is feeling the effects of the, the phenomena much more because they're really being impacted by them. Uh, so even if you can't explain uh, the phenomena scientifically, the population at large is feeling uh, the effects of that phenomenon. So new voices are coming up. Uh, New voices are speaking up, and in the countries, in the different countries nowadays, we see that there is much greater participation in political debates. And Colombia is an example. Of course, if uh, you increase your resilience, uh, uh, the strength of your ecosystems, you will be able to better respond to these challenges. Uh, and in the Colombian case, uh, many of our strategic ecosystems uh, lie in areas uh, which have traditionally been inhabited by indigenous uh, communities or Afro-Americans. Uh, and these populations are participating in the national debate more and more. And they can greatly help uh, so that uh, a more specific uh, treatment can be given to all these environmental measures. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, uh, a conflict between the environment and uh, the mitigation of the effects uh, of uh, the human race on the planet. Uh, so there might be, uh, there will be a need uh, to respond to that conflict, a conflict which is certainly arising around uh, these problems. We see this conflict is already present in many of our countries. Uh, then we might need an additional tool uh, to prevent uh, that conflict, and this would be part of that package you were mentioning, that uh, idea that we have to understand that this is a real phenomena which needs to be measured not only from an economic perspective, but also from a political and social perspective. Uh, I would like to open up uh, the discussion uh, to the audience. Uh, we have time for questions or comments. Good afternoon. I work in Itaú. My name is Ana Lista de Mercado, and I follow many utility companies, and I still see that there is a great deal of conflict still. Uh, uh, we can talk about four months ago, not to go any further. Um, we were on the edge of uh, power rationing, and at that moment, uh, the uh, Mineral and uh, Power Association came out saying that uh, uh, Colombia needed to put more coal into its matrix. Uh, <clears throat> well, of course, I opened up my eyes hugely. And if you look at the uh, midterm plan for UBME, we see that there is a big uh, coal chunk there. Because from an economic point of view, uh, the uh, uh, prices of uh, power 
um, generation uh, is still not big enough. So uh, uh, the economics uh, or the numbers still don't pan out. Uh, uh, let's go and look at the example in Germany where uh, coal is being removed. But of course, we say, well, the government is putting money on the table so that everyone will be able to put on their house roofs a solar panel. And uh, well, in Colombia, there is no way that the government is going to co-finance a solar panel panel for, uh, for each house to have one on top of their own roofs. So what can we do to untangle the, uh, the wheel? Uh, because uh, as we're doing things, there's no way we're going to be able to come up with a congruent plan. This is a very current debate about the energy matrix uh, in uh, Colombia. Uh, the uh, country just approved a, a law on renewables. Uh, we're about to implement it, and we're about to define a financial mechanism to make it more feasible. And uh, in uh, the Commission of Energy Reduction, uh, we're going to have to uh, be more flexible about how we will establish uh, the fees uh, and instruments uh, that will make it more viable for us to improve our power matrix. Um, uh, I think that the effort that we're displaying here and that we will continue to display has to do with the commitments of different sectors uh, so that we will be able uh, to meet uh, our targets, uh, which are 20 percent. Uh, for instance, we haven't defined uh, the contribution of each sector. Uh, for instance, the uh, mining sector and the contribution of the public sector and the, pri and the private sector. So we really need to use the planning instruments that we have, and which are based uh, on the challenges that we have to adapt ourselves to uh, climate uh, change. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, economic planning. In uh, Colombia, 80% of the GDP is uh, produced in an area where we only have uh, uh, a 20% impact. And this is already an indicator uh, to make decisions as to where the production will take place. Um, and on the other hand, we also know that in some areas of the country, because of the effects of climate change, uh, oh, we will have a, uh, a higher level of rain than in others. And this is also another indicator to be able to do our energy or power planning. And we're still learning uh, to keep in mind uh, these uh, uh, scenarios of climate variability uh, in order to integrate them to our planning. I think this is a change of our institutional culture as to how we make our decisions. I'm optimistic. Uh, in, in in terms of uh, the fact that uh, this discussion will take place with the Ministry of Mines and Energies, and we will be able to uh, factor in all these uh, possible scenarios for the long-term and mid-term development of our country. I'm going to make a comment about this. I do believe that the best way to motivate and to encourage uh, to change is is by charging, not being aware of what it costs not to do it. And I want to use an example that I experienced myself with my friends in Switzerland. In the case of Uruguay, just to take an example, their production, electric, electricity production, is via hydraulic means. The idea that the people have in the country facing a potential droughtness what would be the cost for producing electricity? Well, my cost for producing electricity is having to import fossil energy to be able to operate the hydroelectric, the electric power generators. Uh, what does it mean in terms of costs for me? Well, we are going to have an insurance that covers in a parametric manner the difference that I have to spend in order to generate the same electricity that I need, but I don't no longer have water and I have to bring it from fossil energy. And that is a way to create awareness about the cost of not doing or doing something. Mr. Minister, we have time for just one very fast question and this is to close.
and please, very fast and short. Yes, the minister was saying that Colombia's contribution to the greenhouse uh, effect, gas, effect gases. When we look at China and India that have an increasing gigantic middle class and that do contribute to these greenhouse gases and much more, having a mindset of development based on what you were saying as a moderator in the American model of consumption, do you believe that the solution is to change that mindset of that increasing middle class in populations such as China and India, or just simply being based on what we have and look for look for solutions in what we have. In that consumption mind head of the middle class that goes beyond, far beyond the one that we have in Latin America. One couple of elements I think is very important, and it is changing the mindset is not a matter of just uh, running the switch or changing the switch. I think the most important thing there is the market uh, measures, but also, and obviously, legislations, regulations, and the different legal frameworks that could lead to changings, changes in behavior. And on the other hand, we have the subject of looking for all possible ways. It's not one or the other. It is also the big investments that are being made in research and development and technology, including even maybe it's interesting for the case of Colombia in the future, well, like uh, storing carbon that could be one of the solutions for the countries that still depend upon uh, fossil fuels. And uh, as I was saying before, in going back to the first sentence, generation of carbon Markets. I think that the solution for the problems of Chinese, India, USA, and Europe is really in putting some price to carbon and to achieve it in sound markets that have frameworks and legislations that really support them. And that it is what is going to lead us to changes in behavior and production models and changes in the business models. And the last point here is that following what Carlos was saying, it is very important to understand mitigation, uh, gases mitigation or carbonization of, as equivalent to mitigation of risks, as the minister was saying. What you are looking for is to mitigate the political and social and economic risk. And in that sense, it is not a matter of Colombia issuing 0 0.46 or not, is that all, and once again, when we are at 2020, not now, or 2025, we will understand that if we do not go into the field of decarbonization, the only thing that we are going to be doing is just increasing risks. Well, thank you. And this is just to close what I hear here from the whole panel, and I'm surprised, is all use the concept that the we are experiencing a change of awareness. Everyone referred to it as something that it was the common of COD 21. So uh, apparently there's a turning point where we are accepting that this, as a society, is a real and urgent problem and that has at risk, that there is a cost of not doing it. You were saying, Carlos, that this is the last generation that can be, that can do something about it. And it is so real that it is a matter of concern, especially for all those of us who have families. You are also talking about a new awareness implicit in the economy. It is a concept that says how what we produce, we take from the environment. It goes back to the environment, and it stays there and is renewed. This, All these effects and these impacts are compounded multiplied by the population increase. By 2050, we're going to be in more than 9,000 million inhabitants. This planet cannot withstand this model. We talked about solutions. Anna, you said there are solutions. There are technological solutions, innovations, financial tools, and public policies, markets that we can create. We have to understand the value chains. We have to put a price to carbon. We have to generate market all the concepts of uh, this economy. But it is not only useful to prevent, but we have to become aware of the fact that we are 
experiencing a critical situation, and we have to take the measures to adapt ourselves and to mitigate. There are still some other detractors. Every time less and less, every time sounds more and more like a naive, I would say, and probably there are no longer voices that come from the lack of credibility, but they are deliberately coming, come from created interests that try to maintain the statu quo. And the whole thing has some cost. If it were easy, we all would have done it. It has, it is going to have costs for the economies at short and medium term. And it requires a political will, a huge political will. And in order for this to happen, we all know what we have to do. We know the solutions. But it requires political will. But it is implicit in your comment. It is the we, This is the last generation that can do something about it. We don't have another planet. And we don't have another planet for our children and grandchildren. So let's do it. Thank you all. Excellent panel. Thank you.